Okay, so today I want to talk about the unexplained, quote unquote, unexplained death of one Kenneth Engie. He was 27 years old, um, from North Dakota, and this happened on October 3rd going into October 4th, um, 1988. So, let me give you the, the backdrop of this unexplained death on October the night of October 3rd Kenneth is at a bar and he's drinking uh, until it's time to close there's only two patrons left in the bar they're not sitting together but they are friends they both work as auto body auto mechanic type people at garages it's Kenneth Engie and as far as I can tell his friend now by friend I don't know through my research if they were really associates or friends I mean there's a big difference there they certainly knew each other because of working in the same vocation his name was Curtis Heck now the bar is getting ready to close the barmaid tells Kenneth that he has to leave he's intoxicated and he says no I'm taking you home tonight she in turn says no Curtis has taken me home an argument ensues where the friends get into a physical confrontation I would like to know the barmaid's story about this, but I can't find it anywhere. All I can find is Curtis's story as I watched an interview with him. He states he kind of got the best of Kenny and had him down and said, hey, I'll let you up, but you're going to have to leave. It was more of a wrestling type situation instead of a lot of punches being thrown. Kenny gets up and he walks out. A minute or so later, they hear a crash outside. They come out and they had observed that Kenny had taken his truck and intentionally rammed Curtis's vehicle. So after the barmaid closes, Curtis is stewing about this. So him and the barmaid, about an hour later, from the altercation drive to Kenny's residence he gets out Curtis gets out of the vehicle and goes over and he starts kicking and putting dents in Kenny's vehicle the truck that he had rammed Curtis's vehicle with while he's doing this and he gets done he hears a groaning type of noise coming from the garage this vehicle was parked outside the garage Curtis goes into the garage and he sees Kenny laying on the floor of his garage, kind of like groaning in a drunken stupor. Curtis says some words to him to the effect, you know, you know, good for you, whatever. He assumes that he's drunk and he just leaves him there and leaves. Next afternoon 3 30 Kenny's uncle finds Kenny laying dead on the floor in his garage hence the mystery 
Well, let's see what the medical examiner has to say, right? Because right now, we just have a victim laying in the garage. Um, the evidence that's there, there is a pool, a small pool of blood. There is a 22 rifle about six feet from the body. And that's all we have. Now, we certainly have a suspect, right? He, old Curtis, they had just gotten into a scuffle. He, not only that, he went out of his way to go to Kenny's residence to maybe confront him again, or at least do damage to his vehicle, which he admitted to all of us. But he obviously says, I did not kill him. Well, what does the medical examiner say? Well, according to the medical examiner, Old Kenny Engel, NG, I'm sorry, Kenneth NG, uh, died of, you did not guess it, carbon monoxide poisoning. So, why is the gun there? What's the pool of blood for? A lot of this doesn't make sense to me. Now, one of the key this is another good pun. Man, I'm good at these puns. Another key observation is the key in the ignition of the truck that was in the garage was off. Okay? Vehicle was not running when Curtis arrived, nor was it running, obviously, when the uncle found the body. So what happened? Well... <clears throat> There's a couple scenarios, you know when a death takes place as always you have to look at is it an accident? Is it natural causes? Is it homicide? Is it suicide? Well in this case, I think you can rule out accident or I'm sorry natural causes So that leaves three left. It's either suicide which is very possible Homicide, which is very possible, or an accident, which is very possible. So this one's very difficult because it's hard to deduce. Now, we just did. We went from four to three. But still, okay, well, let's try to figure out what happened. The officials originally believed it was suicide. Now, you say, now, how can you kill yourself, carbon monoxide? You have... I've seen it. I've seen it first hand, up close and personal. When I was assigned to the FBI, uh, we did a major drug case. And when we served the warrants, I interviewed a gentleman who was going to get indicted for uh, delivery of meth. He was going to do significant time. And... I sat there at the table, across from him, told him his options, what was going to happen, and, you know, did a normal interview like I would do anybody else. The next day, he was found with his face duct taped, um, basically around the exhaust pipe of his vehicle, which was in a garage, which the doors obviously were closed. And he was found, obviously, deceased that way. And one of the things that I remember is uh, how cherry red the body is from carbon monoxide poisoning. I'd like to know if that was the case on this. But the information I found on this is very sparse. So it's possible. Let's look at the suicide angle. It's possible. He's very drunk. He just kind of got beat up. I don't know his living arrangements and stuff like that. It's where victimology comes in uh, very prevalent. But I just don't know enough about it. But I do know that intoxication will obviously make you do very dumb things sometimes. And you don't think right. So... The suicide angle, yes, it's possible. He takes... The 22 rifle into the garage, thinking about killing himself, um, turns on his truck, 
you know, which way am I going to do it type of thing. Am I going to shoot myself? Am I going to, you know, die of the carbon monoxide? I don't, I don't see that, and I'll tell you why. If he was intoxicated and he was going to kill himself, why not do it in the house where it's warm? You know, the temperatures uh, in this region was very cold that night. Um, so why go out there to do that when you could just shoot yourself? He takes the rifle with him. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So let's let's you know let's rule out suicide for the time being. Let's look at instead uh, homicide. Pretty hard to kill somebody. No, let me take that back. It's not hard to kill somebody by carbon monoxide poisoning. But in this instance, boy. You sure have means, you sure have motives, you sure have opportunity. But who, who places himself there but the main suspect? And let me tell you something. I am not an expert in interviews. I also don't believe in body language. If you've watched my videos, you'll you you know this. Just like polygraphs, I, I don't trust them. I've seen them work and I've seen them fail. So to me, they're not 100 proof. Same with body language. Same with forensic linguists. Uh, I, d I don't believe in any of that. Um, and I believe in evidence. I believe in victimology. So with that being said. When I watched Curtis's interview, he came off a thousand percent believable. Very, very credible and believable. Again, that doesn't mean much, you know, because it's just my opinion. He could be fooling me, you know. People have fooled me before. <laughs> so... But he puts himself there. He says everything that he did and the way that he explains everything, the way he talks is very credible to me. But boy, he's a suspect. What, you know, isn't it? Is it just happenstance that he gets into a fight with this guy at a bar and an hour later that guy is dead? Now, if that guy would have died of a gunshot, would we be looking at this differently? I would say yes. But because it's carbon monoxide poisoning, for me, it takes down the possibility of it being homicide a little bit. Now, the victims or the victim's family, they want to say that it was homicide and Curtis is responsible and I understand that I've seen that hundreds and if not thousands of times from victims especially when it's suicide they just cannot believe it um, you know I like to tell the story of a senator from uh, New Mexico that hired me a few years ago to investigate the death of his daughter it was ruled a suicide and there was no doubt in my mind after I researched it and, and did my investigation that it was suicide. And he still would not accept that. I get it. There's no ill will. You know, you could call me all the names you want in the world because I didn't see it the way you see it. I get it. You know, it's your loved one and I don't fault you at all for that. You know, take that anger out on me. That's fine. Um, but... The same can be said for homicide um, and accidents. And let's talk about that. Let's talk about the accident aspect of it. Let's say Kenny gets home and he's still angry. Yes, he, he got beat up a little bit, maybe put in his place. 
he exacted some revenge by backing into Curtis's vehicle uh, purposely. He goes home. He's still intoxicated. Uh, maybe in his mind, he knew that Curtis was going to come to the house. So he grabs his rifle, goes out, sits in the garage. It's cold. He starts his truck. Um to warm up you know it's cold out there he's waiting he's waiting he's waiting maybe he dozes off because it's an hour he's he's expecting him to be there he's not coming he dozes off the carbon monoxide gets to him he wakes up realizes oh i'm a little dizzy he isn't here yet uh i'm going in the house turns off the ignition steps out takes a couple steps boom he goes down, drops the rifle, and the carbon monoxide poisoning overtakes him. That's when Curtis arrives, sees him, thinks he's drunk, passed out, groaning because he's drunk, leaves him there, and he dies. Possible, right? The only problem that I have with that is the rifle. If he has the rifle, does that mean that he intended on killing Curtis when he arrived? That takes it to a whole new level. That's different than just waiting to maybe confront somebody and have a fight. He has that rifle with him for a reason, and it's fully loaded. That makes me pause a little bit. And, and not believe that theory of accident. Now, is it possible that Curtis came over, they had more words and got into a fight in the garage? Yes. But who was the most important witness of that? The barmaid. She's still in the truck, right? She'll know what happened in that garage. If, they, if Curtis was in there more than the 10 seconds... That he says he was in there, well, then we got to look at him as a possible suspect. Maybe he punched and got into it again with him, knocked him down, his head hit the concrete, um, truck was still running, he left him there, decided, you know what, I better go back and check on him. So maybe four or five hours later, whatever, he goes back to the house, goes in the garage, sees Kenny's not moving. Turns off the vehicle. Who knows, right? That's a mystery. And that is what's the, the damnedest misery about these equivocal deaths. Is because you don't know. But you can kind of start deducing and it makes it fairly easy. With this, if I had more information, I think I'd be able to do that. One of the things that really intrigues me and I want to know more about and I don't know is the pool of blood. Nobody has ever explained that to my knowledge. What's the pool of blood from? Is it from him hitting his head when he fell? Because that's a whole different scenario too. If he hit his head while he fell, you're looking more probable than not that it was homicide. You know, some people say they don't believe in coincidences. I get that. And in this case, I see it. You get into a fight with a guy at a bar over a girl. You escalate the situation by going to his house then to confront him more. Um, that has homicide written all over it. Then you look at the medical examiner's report and say he died of carbon monoxide. These, are, This is one of those cases that really is intriguing but there's just not enough there I'd want to know more and I can't find it for me if I was that investigator that pool of blood you better be taking samples of that I know this was what 1988 there's no DNA for another eight years but I, I there's blood typing in 88. 
I'd want to know, is that pool of blood the same blood types of the victims? If they didn't collect that, you'll never know. What, what, what was it? Whose was it? What better way to kill somebody under the disguise of suicide or accident than, than carbon monoxide poisoning, right? So I can see all of these scenarios. I can see accidental death. I can see suicide. I can see homicide. All three. So in this case, I cannot come to a conclusion. Just simply because there's not enough information there. But it's still fascinating and it's still a great case study regardless of that. All the scenarios kind of fit. But again, the most important person in this is the barmaid. And I did not see one single interview done with her. I would want to talk to her and ask her these questions. How angry was Curtis from the time that the fight was over at the bar until you arrived at Kenny's residence with Curtis? What was, what was he talking about? What was his anger level? When Curtis got out and started kicking Kenny's truck, which was outside of the garage, and he walked into the garage, how long was he in there for? When he came out of the garage, was he out of breath? Did he have any blood on him? What did he say occurred inside that garage? Then, where did you go? Did you guys go back to, did he drop you off? Did you spend the night with him? Did he leave any time between that and the next day, 3.30 when the body was discovered? She's a key witness, key witness. Now again, I said Curtis, when he came off in that interview that I watched with him, very believable you know scale of one to ten in believability one being the worst ten being the most he was a ten I believed every word that he said I've had girlfriends that have told me things and I believed every word they said and it was a lie so I guess I'm not a good judge of character or or truth so he could have been lying but the barmaid is the person who knows and that is a clue right that's a lead to solve the case let's say they never collected the blood let's say they don't even know where that blood come from let's say the victim had no outside injuries no blood not bleeding through the nose nothing okay they didn't collect that you still have the barmaid it wasn't like curtis went there by himself and that's all you have is one witness you have somebody else you better talk to her if you have i'm sure they did I'm sure they did. Um, I'd like to know what she said. So, depending upon what she said, then you can start deducing from the three possibilities to hopefully one probability, whether it's suicide, you know, accident, or homicide. The rifle being six feet from the body. Now, that could be many reasonings. He threw it. I don't need this to take care of this guy. When he's stumbling out of the vehicle, feeling from the effects of the carbon monoxide, you know, he drops it and continues to stagger on before he falls. Um, all those are good possibilities and we don't know. The location of it being six foot from the body isn't as important to me as is why he had it now another good possibility especially for north dakota maybe he had that 22 in his truck already and he's sitting in that truck warming up awaiting for the confrontation that he knows is coming and it just happened to be there in the intoxicated state he just grabs it he says all right we'll, we'll play when you get here that's possible and then he's like oh, i don't need this right so many scenarios and it's the what if and the whys um 
I'm going to go through my notes here, see if there's anything that I missed. The ignition off in the truck, I talked about that. The small pool of blood. And again, that's a very arbitrary thing. Small amount. What's a small amount? Dime size? Grapefruit size? You know, compared to what? I need to know what a small amount of blood is. Pool of blood. Which is different. The interview with Curtis again. So... This is a, this was a case that was on Unsolved Mysteries at one point in time as well. I remember all these cases from when I was a kid and I watched Unsolved Mysteries. Robert Stack. Probably, it's probably the best show ever. Uh, especially now when you watch it because there's updates on almost half of them. And that's what I like. So, But this one is still it stuck with me. Very, uh, very limited information. I'd like to know more. So if there's anybody out there that knows more about this case, uh, Kenneth Engie and Curtis Hatt, what has happened with it? You know, where's the barmaid? What was her story? I need to know these things, right? Keeps me up at night thinking possibilities, probabilities. What happened? That's why I became a detective. You know, it's crazy to think that when I was 12, 13, 14, 15 years old and I watched these shows, Unsolved Mysteries and Red Helder Skelter and, you know, just fascinated by this stuff. There wasn't a true crime genre back then. To me, it was just, you know, unsolved um, cases that fascinated me and then you fast forward 15 20 30 years whatever it is now and you know I think about I had dinner with one of the Manson family girls and got to ask all my questions about Charles Manson and Tex and Susan Atkins and Dennis Wilson the Beach Boys and the music and all that and getting a letter from Vincent Bugliosi a handwritten letter at that on his deathbed then to run a cool case organization where you know I had Henry Lee Cyril Weck Bob Kepler Joe Kenda Mary Ellen O'Toole Joe Kennedy the list goes on and on and to interact with them and work on some cases with them mind-boggling sometimes it just goes to show you that whatever you want in life whatever your passion is whatever vocation it is as long as you have passion for it you can certainly follow that and make it become a dream make it become a reality and that's what I did and I like to say a lot of times that I got lucky you know in some of the things but it also takes a lot of hard work. But when you have passion for something and you want to do it, guess what? It isn't hard work. It's doing what you love. So somebody sent me a book. Uh, it, it's not out yet, but the publisher sent it to me um, about the uh, murders in Shenandoah Forest. But there was a chapter in there about me and the author meeting me and it was kind of funny because she described me as part look depending on the situation I could look like a Hells Angel member or a geeky AV nerd I certainly never saw that side of me but okay I guess she did uh, but she described me as a a true crime celebrity you know a celebrity in the true crime world where everybody knew me or something like that and I read that like four times and it just made me think one I don't know whether that's true or not uh, but two even to be mentioned like that from where you came from small country 
town of Penns Valley, Pennsylvania. It's humbling, you know, it really is. So it brings a smile to my face and there's very few things anymore in this world that bring a smile to my face, especially the older I get, unfortunately. So I thought that that was nice. I wanted to share that with you. So, hey, any information about this case, you know, let me know because I'll forward it to the correct people if you don't know how to get it there. All right, that's it. So until next time, Maine's out.